Hello, hi there. My name is Jenny Fortier. I'm the owner of Northern Wildflowers. We um, grow and sell native wildflower and vegetable seed and we're based in Sudbury. Uh, I'm here with the uh, No Beep, the Northern Ontario Black Economic Empowerment Program folks today at Lake Laurentian Conservation Area. And today we're chatting a little bit about wild uh, products, wild foods, and uh, how we can use them to create small businesses. So we're starting at the source. We're starting somewhere where you can collect some of these things. And we're going to chat a little bit about harvesting them sustainably. We're going to chat about safety, identification, um, um, orienteering, you know, not getting lost uh, when you're looking for these things. So we're going to go through all of that. Um, so the first thing I want to start with is just talk a little bit about safety and the things that I bring with me that I think are a good idea to bring with you. If you're going into, um, you know, I don't want to call this backcountry because we're still in the city and we're still on a very well, well marked trail, but still, you know, you never know um, what your day could end up looking like. So first things first, um, I bring water with me um, wherever I go. I know today we're going to be out here for a few hours and it's cool so I brought one bottle of water but if we were here in the afternoon or if I was going on a full day hike I would bring myself two bottles of water because that is um, probably the most important thing to have with you uh, summer or winter when you're going um, out into the wilderness. The other thing you want to make sure you're doing um, is making sure if you're on your own that people know where you are. Um, there's even apps you can use, um, there's trail uh, apps and hiking apps you can use that send uh, a ping to a contact of yours to tell them where you are um, if something happens to you. But I, you know, I have people who know where I am and I'm with a group, but I would always make sure someone knows, hey, this is where I'm going, this is when I'm coming back. Um, so that's very important because you never know if, you know, you could lose consciousness or you could, if you're on a bike, you could fall and get a concussion or, you know, you could get lost. So the most important thing is someone knows where you are. Um, the next most important thing when we talk about safety um, and where the spot we've chosen today isn't a terrible spot for this, but if we talk about, you know, blueberry picking or that sort of thing, anywhere where you're stopping on the side of the road, the biggest safety concern you need to worry about is traffic. Um, people worry about bears and uh, you know lots of other things, but traffic is really your biggest safety concern. So if you're stopping on the side of the road, you have to be really, really mindful. Pretend oncoming cars can't see you at all. Pretend you're invisible. So you need to make sure you're not placing yourself anywhere where you could um, you know, uh, get injured or um, making sure that you're pulling off somewhere very safe on the side of the road. Um, so when we talk about wild collecting, there's always things I bring. So I have my water, um, I bring with me, um, I've got my keys in here. I always bring a bag because I find when I'm carrying things, I put them down and then I leave them there. So I'm bringing a hat today. I have my bug spray um, for anyone who needs it. And then I also have toilet paper because you never know if you're going to need toilet paper um, for the ladies if you you know really have to go um, you know kind of head off trail make a little hole and bury your toilet paper um, ideally you don't have to ideally you went before but such is life um, I also bring flagging tape if I see something really interesting um, I'll flag it knowing that on my way out I'm going to remove the flagging tape um, I bring a tiny little first aid kit, especially if I'm going out with a group. The main thing about the first aid kit is just having band-aids. Um, you know, the, you're not going to fix a broken arm with this, but um, the band-aids are great to have if you've got an open cut and the heat and the sweating and the, all that, you know, just to keep it clean. Um, other things I bring, I've got some ID manuals because we're talking about plants. I've got some compasses and we're going to spend just a quick two minutes talking about using them and then I have my phone um, so this can be the best tool and it can be the worst tool so um, never go somewhere totally relying on your phone um, because you never know when you're gonna lose reception there's a lot of places inside the city of Sudbury where you'll lose reception um, and you never know when your phone's gonna die so um, a few things I do whenever I go anywhere I know exactly where I'm going before I leave um, so I've looked at a map and I know where I'm going before I leave. Um, and I also, if I'm using a map on my phone, instead of relying on reception, I take a screenshot of it and I make sure that that's on my phone. Um, otherwise, I use my phone for plant identification apps. 
Um, I find it's really useful for that and for taking pictures. But otherwise, just don't rely on this tool um, to not get you lost or um, to help you know where you're going because you never know when you're going to lose reception or your batteries are going to die. So we can look a little bit. Um, compasses are great to have. Not that I use them every time I go out, but they're great to have. So here, Folu, I'm going to hand you and I'm going to show you how to use it. You're welcome. So you want to come a little... Okay, so, so the main thing with the compass um, is it's going to show you where north is. So first you want to do a quick spin, right? And we're going to let the magnets on our compass show us where north is. So our red needle is going to point to north. So my red needle is pointing to north. So north is this way. So I'm going to know all day I'm heading north. And if I want to come back to the car, the car is south. And I know if I walk south, I'm going to no matter where I go, I'm going to run in to the highway. <laughs> so I know if I get lost today and I head south, I will either end up, you know, down there on 69 or down there or in this neighborhood. I know that south is a safe direction to go. So that's the main reason I bring a compass is if you get really turned around and you know leaving, you know, I, I know that I'm parked northwest and there's a road here. I know if I head northwest today, I'm going to find something that's going to take me back to my car. So that's the main reason you want a compass because it's very easy to get turned around, um, especially if you're on a landscape where there's not a lot of markers that can help you really ID where you are. So did you find north? Yes. So yeah, so move around a bit. You want this red guy, I'm going to hold it like this. You want this red guy to point north, so keep moving. Keep going. <laughs> so, so keep it nice and still and you want right there. So now you're pointing north. So that's north and then that means this is south. So our cars are south. So is the road, right? Um, and if you want to get, you know, more uh, sophisticated, you could, as you're leaving, sort of go, okay, if I had um, southwest at... 200 degrees on my compass, I'm going to head exactly to the to the car. So uh, we don't have to be that sophisticated, but they're great little light tools to have on you um, and just to help you sort of orient yourself if you do get lost. Um, because, you know, if you if you get lost and you can hear the traffic, it's one thing, you know, it's, it's hard to get lost in the city because you can usually hear something that tells you where things are. Um, but what's really inconvenient is you can hear the traffic, but there's like a wetland between you and where you want to go. So the compass can help you go, no, I need to go, I need to go, you know, like northeast at this degree. And this will take me back to, you know, a safe way back rather than trekking through really difficult terrain or that sort of thing. So those are some of the things that we bring. I'm also, I have some bags for collecting. Um, paper bags and baskets are better. Um, and uh and so that those are all the things that that we're going to bring today and of course my car keys so yeah any questions good okay so we'll head in all right so we're talking about wild collected foods and it's really within the context of um, looking at some of these resources as potential raw materials for a business, right? So if you're looking at starting a business um, and you want to create something, the main thing you need to find is raw materials that you can source reliably, reliably and at prices that make sense for you to turn it into a product you can sell, right? And so wild materials are an awesome option there because um, you don't need to own land to, to grow them they're there nature is providing them um the question is can you get them at enough uh at, at quantities that will make your business idea work at a price that makes sense and also um, can you find an area where it's acceptable to collect them so uh, gina had a great question you know how do we know where we can and can't collect them so um so th there's a number of places you can go to find wild products right so you can go on private property uh, if you have permission so if you own property or you know a property owner who has given you permission that's totally fine um, you can collect on crown land 
Um, so that's uh, land that belongs to um, the government of Canada. So crown land is kind of land that belongs to everyone and no one. So it's shared, it's all of ours, everyone's responsible for, um, you know, enjoying that land responsibly, uh, you know, not littering, um, you know, if you're collecting there, doing it responsibly, all of those things. And then the, some of the other places where um, you'll find, uh, you know, uh, accessible trails and whatnot are conservation areas. And so uh, different conservation areas have different um, positions around foraging and wild collecting. Some allow it, some don't. So you really have to check with your local conservation area to find out if that's something that they permit or not. Um, and then you've got provincial and uh, national parks and uh, provincial and national parks both do not allow any wild collecting within the parks. So that's something important to know. Um, there's some considerable fines too um, there. And the idea there is that you've got these spaces that are really put aside for enjoyment and, and they're used by large numbers of people. And so, you know, it, it becomes a slippery slope of if you allow those type of activities, does it, you know, um, ruin the integrity of those spaces? So your best places are, you know, Crown Land, but sometimes, you know, it, you want a trail where you feel safe if it's something new to you. So Crown Land may not be the best option for you. Um, if you have a local conservation that allows it, that's a great option. Um, and again, provincial and national parks don't allow um, those type of activities. So um, we're here at Lake Laurentian Conservation Area, um, um, which is a really great resource within Sudbury for, you know, enjoying the outdoors, but also, um, you know, you're free to collect responsibly in these, in these areas. And when I say responsibly, um, some of the rules around sustainable wild collections are, you know, you leave nothing behind. So you leave no garbage behind. Um, you're not collecting whole plants. So you're not digging up a plant and affecting the stand in that way. Um, you're not trampling stands uh, and you're also collecting a bare minimum from each stand. So essentially, um, you know, there's some, some wild raspberries to my right here. Um, and if I want to collect wild raspberries, um, I need to remember that this is also a seed for this species and it's also food for wildlife. So I may collect 10% um, or I may um, collect from one patch and then skip two and then collect from the next one. So those are some of the, um, the different kind of uh, rules of thumb that wild collectors will follow. So to make sure they're collecting sustainably, um, you need to be mindful of who else is using uh, the trail system. You know, are the trails here a shared use? So, you know, you give right away to anyone coming um, on the trail and whatnot and make sure you're not impeding flow. Um, but essentially, uh, you know, knowing where you can collect sustainably and doing it in a respectful way is very important. Um, and of course, when I'm talking about where collection is allowed, um, members of First Nations uh, communities uh, have treaty rights so they can collect in, in all of those uh, places um, and, and that's uh, permitted. So, so we're looking at wild raspberries here. So, you know, wild raspberries are sort of, when it comes to the berries um, that we look at in Ontario, first you've got strawberries um, that happen early July. We miss the wild strawberries. Then come the raspberries and the blueberries. So we're in raspberry season. Um, wild raspberries um, are this interesting mix of all kinds of hybrid berries. So these guys um, could be hybrids of like three different kinds of raspberries. Um, raspberries get really complicated like that. But you know that it's a raspberry and you know that it's edible um, because it's got these little segments in the berry and there's a seed in every segment. So all of the members of this family, of this rubus family, which includes like blackberries, raspberries, um, <clears throat> bumbleberries, um, they all have berries like this. Um, and I'm not aware of anything else in this area that looks like this that's not edible. So if you see a berry with segments like this, um, you can take out your ID guide and ID it down to the generally to the species, you know, you can figure out if it's a blackberry or a raspberry or a bumbleberry or a dewberry, um, but they're generally all edible. I'm not gonna eat this one because I really squished it. Um, 
but uh, but yeah, so we've got some raspberries here. Um, if you know you're collecting raspberries, you might want to wear some gloves because they are thorny. Um, we're wearing pants today for that reason because when you're uh, collecting some of these things, you will kind of get your feet and your legs into some of these wet areas. But also, um, you know, we do have um, things like poison ivy, poison hemlock, poison oak um, in and around this area. So you just want to kind of protect yourself from those things. So yeah, so we've got some wild raspberries here um, that are lots of fun. And, uh, and you'll often see them growing along paths. They like disturbed areas, but they also, um, birds move them, people move them. Um, so you'll often find in an area where you'll find raspberry, you might find like three different kinds of raspberries. And then you might find blackberries in that same area. And you might find like wild cherries. And that's because the animals who are eating them and then excreting their seeds are kind of hanging out nearby. So whether it's a bear or a bird or a raccoon and they're kind of creating this garden around them so often when you find one edible thing you'll find a lot of edible things which is really cool so um, and that's also um, you know the the types of uh, edible forests that um, First Nation communities um, that came before us would establish as well is you know on these walking corridors and these areas that were more commonly used um, you know they were they were putting in edible plants for for their convenience and for their consumption so um, so we've got some raspberries here these small trees these are cherries here as well and I imagine if we looked hard enough we would probably also find some um, uh, Saskatoon berry which is a tree with edible berries and then behind you there's more wild um, cherry there so that's uh, that looks like it's a pin cherry I have to get closer it could be a choke cherry but um, so it's interesting to see these things all kind of you find them in really common areas and that's you know probably a bear you know took a break five years ago and you know decided to go for number two and just left all these berry seeds all over so so now we have all these berries so so we'll keep moving and we'll see what else we find feel free to pick some there's some really nice juicy ones here Uh, a, a concern that folks always have when they're, you know, going into, uh, you know, um, going into the woods is bears and, you know, bears are a really real consideration uh, in our area. And so a few things to keep in mind. So, um, you know, I, I spend a lot of time in the fo forest, a lot on my, by myself, um, usually with my dog though. Um, and I've never had, you know, anything remotely, you know, close to a bad experience with bears. I've seen lots and, you know, it's just more about knowing how to behave in those situations. So the main thing to keep in mind is you have to be aware of what's around you and you have to hear and smell and know what's around you and you have to make noise because every animal in the forest hears and smells better than we do so they will hear you and smell you and know you're coming if you're making noise usually just us walking makes enough noise that anything around us is sort of you know creating this pocket and scattering around us and keeping away from us uh, but you don't want to go into the forest wearing headphones because you want to hear what's going on around you um, you also uh, want to make sure that you're making noise either, you know, if I'm by myself, I'm like humming or, you know, you might want a bear bell or I might even like turn on my phone and play music or I'm calling to like my dog or I'm talking to whoever I'm with if I'm with people. So you want to make noise because these animals want to avoid you. Uh, when you, you hear stories about, you know, things going wrong, it's because there's a surprise encounter and that's never a good situation. Um, so you want to make sure you're making noise. Um, and also you want to know what to do if you see a bear. So bears are, you know, they're not animals that actively, you know, hunt people or want to have interactions with them. Unless they're finding food nearby, then they may come back. But they're not, you know, they're not after people. They're just after the food. So you want to just remind yourself every time you go into the forest what you want to do if you see a bear. Because if you see one, all of those things will go out the window and you'll forget so kind of actively remind yourself if i see a bear i am not running and the reason for that is bears can behave a lot like cats 
if something runs away from them, they become curious and it rouses their, um, their sort of fight, flight, predator response where they go, is that something I should eat? I'm going to go take a look. Um, and that's when, you know, you hear about maulings or whatnot, where the bear is going, okay, it must be food because it's running away. It's like a cat. When you hand it a ball, it doesn't care, but you throw the ball and it gets, you know, all excited and it chases it. So you don't want to run from a bear um, because you won't outrun it anyway. So there's really no point. Um, so you don't want to run from a bear. And you also want to keep in mind that you are very intimidating to that bear as well. So if a bear approaches you, you're going to stand your ground and you're going to talk to it. You're going to say, you know, the training I received was like, whoa, bear, stop bear. You're like, no, thank you, bear. <laughs> or maybe that's what I say to my kids. But um, those are all and you're calming yourself too, right? Like you're kind of it's a psychological thing you're doing to yourself where you're like, I am in control of the situation. This this animal, it doesn't want to hurt me. I'm letting it know in a calm, stern voice, you know. That, that I'm you not know, something it wants to mess with. And you would slowly back out of the situation. Um, most of the time when I've seen bears, they do exactly what an animal who is kind of afraid will do. They sit quietly and they're watching you because they're going, oh darn, there's like something here. I didn't, I didn't hear it coming, I didn't see it, I didn't smell it, and they're sitting there and they're waiting for you to leave most of the time so that's not a bad thing that doesn't mean that bear is bold it doesn't mean whatever it means it's going like if i sit here maybe it won't see me or you'll see the bear crossing the road going i know you're in a car i'm perfectly safe or it's a really bold bear that's going i'm just i know you're here i'm doing my own thing i'm going over there i smell some fresh blueberries i'll see you later so most of the time they're not after you they don't care about you and they don't want to be around you so just make sure you're doing the things to make sure you're not surprising that animal. You know, other animals you don't want to surprise are large animals like moose that in the fall, you know, can charge at things that scare them. So you want to make sure that you're making noise and you're being aware of your surroundings um, and you're never approaching wild animals. You know, you're not trying to take videos of wild animals and that sort of thing. Um, so the other signs of bears that, that will tell you that there's a bear nearby is they smell really terrible, like, like sewage, like they smell really bad if you're downwind. So if you are in the woods and you smell something terrible, that means it's a good time to turn around and, and go back. Um, the other things that show you a bear's been around, which are totally fine, um, is, you know, this, this tells me a bear was here. Um, this isn't cause for alarm, but this is what bears do. When they find a berry bush, they like to sit and eat. So they'll, they'll usually break the bush, they'll pull it down to them and they'll sit and they'll eat it. So that's okay, we know there's bears here. Um, does it mean a bear was just here? No, not at all. Um, other things to watch out for is if you find bear droppings and it's, you know, it's gonna be a big pile and it's gonna have lots of berry pits in it and it's gonna be berry colored this time of year and it's steaming then that means the bear is closer than you want and you want to turn around and go back. Um, other than that, you know, make noise, uh, be really aware of your surroundings and, and you'll be totally, um, you know, you'll have all your bases covered. Um, I bring a dog with me. Uh, I know what my dog does when it sees wildlife. And so I'm comfortable with that. Um, there are, you know, I've had other dogs in the past where I see what they do in they see wildlife and I'm not comfortable with that. So those dogs, I'm, you know, a lot more weary about like holding on to or keeping on a short leash because if you have a dog that's prone to like chasing and trying to flush out animals that are much larger than it, that's not a safe situation for you because that animal could potentially, you know, chase that animal and then bring it back to you and irritate that animal. Um, I have a, a dog that I know stands in front of me and barks. And so I'm comfortable with, with that. But, um, but you know, that's another thing to consider is are you, are you bringing an animal with you that's going to irritate wildlife and create issues for you? And if you are, um, it should be on a leash. And if you're on a trail like this in a conservation area, it should be on a leash anyway. So, so those are all things to consider. So, um, yeah. So, so, yeah, probably a bear was here, probably ate some of these cherries and moved along, moved on his way. Um, another edible plant here that doesn't have berries yet is this one here is American mountain ash, these little um, compound leaves here. Um, so that will have orange berries uh, later in the season, more in the fall. And those berries are also edi edible, edible. Where is it? Um, this one here, this guy here. 
They're also edible, but they don't taste particularly good. Um, but in terms of just interesting business ideas, um, so many of our berries have really, really great um, health benefits. And a lot of them have like crazy amounts of antioxidants and, uh, and you know, there's so many medicinal uses. Um, American mountain ash is a interesting one that not a lot of people collect because it doesn't taste good but it could be a cool business idea in the sense that, you know, maybe that's a berry that you dry and you turn into a powder and you make this amazing antioxidant tea. So when you look at these products, if you're seeing, um, I shouldn't call them products, when you're looking at these wild um, foods and you're seeing things that, you're like, there's a lot of this in this area where I hike or um, there's a lot of this in this area I like to go where I'm permitted to collect. Uh, those are neat business ideas to think of. Like, you know, no one's collecting this. There's a ton of it. I can get to it. What can I do with this, you know, in an economical fashion? Um, and sometimes it's something like that, like taking a product and drying it. Or, um, you know, there's a, a business we work with that takes beautiful little flowers and presses them and dries them and bakes with them. And the way that they've built their business, they don't need a lot of these flowers. Um, so, so they're, you know, using a resource they don't have a lot of, but they're creating a product out of it, um, that works for them financially. So, so those are all neat things to think about is, can I get enough of this? What can I do with it? Um, that would make sense financially from a business standpoint. So. Uh, You're welcome. Um, so we're just stopping here to look at, um, these berries aren't ready yet, but this is a member of the viburnum family. So this looks to be Northern wild raisin. Um, I've got my ID books so I could use the books to ID them. And there's so many books you can buy for plant ID. You just want to make sure that they're books that are focused on our area. So, um, this is a great, uh, ID plant for forest plants in Northeastern Ontario wild berries of Ontario. So you want to make sure it's like Ontario or Northern Ontario so that you're not getting all these species that we don't actually have here. So there's lots of great ID manuals you can you can find at different bookstores. Again, there's apps you can use on your phone. I use an app called iNaturalist that allows me to take a picture and then it um, provides suggestions of what it could be. And then I can further look and say, oh, okay, yeah, that is what it is. So, um, so this one is a member of the viburnum family um, and viburnums, most of them are edible. Um, the berries aren't ready yet, but I know it's a viburnum um, because of the berry shape. So there are these kind of long flat berries, but then if I look inside, there's a pit inside and it's not quite developed well yet, but it will be. Um, and it's kind of, it's almost like um, a cherry pit, but it's very long and skinny. And that tells me it's a viburnum. Uh, and we'll take a look at some of the wild cherry uh, berries. They're not ready yet, but we'll find inside kind of um, like a uh, more of a rounded oblong pit like a cherry. So uh, so all of the viburnums are edible. Um, some of them aren't that great tasting. Uh, some of them are better to freeze first and then use like to juice or whatnot. They get sweeter once they're um, frozen or they'll get added to jam with something sweeter like strawberries or blueberries or whatnot. Uh, but this one looks to be Northern Wild Raisin. Um, and this one is is edible doesn't taste great but it's edible and it's got lots of uh lots of you know great vitamins and antioxidants in it as well so um that's called spreading dogbane it's um it's a native shrub it's bees really like it um and it's like once you start to notice the blooms you'll notice it everywhere and then when it stops blooming it just blends in with everything else but um yeah, it's a nice native shrub, good for pollinators. Um, it's a nice landscaping shrub too. It's pretty, you know, it, it's pretty low maintenance. So, so uh, I just wanted to point out, so here we do have some blueberry bushes here and blueberry grows in a lot of different areas. This is low bush blueberry, but it really fruits and produces a lot of fruit when it's in full sun. So there's actually, we're going to see a lot of blueberry bush on the side of the trails in the uh, shade. And don't waste your time even looking around if you're in a shaded area at the blueberry bushes. You want to move up and you want to go into full sun. Uh, so uh, that's what we're going to do. We're going to head further down the trail and just head up onto a little bit of a mountain where they're getting full sun and that's where they're going to produce all the fruit. So, um, so yeah, so these are blueberry bushes, but they don't produce a lot of fruit if they're not in full sun. 
Yeah, so there's a, there's a few things mixed in here, but there's some blueberry bushes as well. So now we're in a different habitat. We're in this sort of um, primary succession field. Um, and in this area, we've got a huge stand of blackberry um, plants. And so they're not ready yet. They're gonna be ready in probably three to four weeks. But if you look around, the ground is covered in these. So this is gonna be an awesome place to get blackberries in three to four weeks. And that's part of the thinking you wanna have when you're foraging. Once you find somewhere where you can forage, that's you know a location that's convenient for you, is every time you're there, you're kind of looking at like, what's coming, what's next? Um, what can I get here in two or three weeks? Um, and then you can really get to know that area. So there's gonna be lots of blackberries here. Um, and then we've got some yarrow here, which is um, a uh, medicinal plant that has so many uses. Um, we've got more wild raspberry growing here. And then um, this small tree and these small trees back here are wild cherries. I'm gonna find one with cherries on it and I'll show you guys um, the pits. Yeah, so I don't see any cherries on these. So we'll find a tree with some cherries on it. Um, and then like anywhere else, you see kind of this mixture of native and non-native things. So much of our landscape is made up of things that have been introduced um, that have just kind of become part of the landscape. So I'm looking around, I see clover. This is not native. Um, toad flax, also not native. Trefoil, not native. Timothy, not native, but it's part of the landscape. Um, and it's what we call naturalized. So it's something that uh, usually naturalized species were brought over in the last like 200 years and they've become part of the landscape and they're not, um, you know, they're kind of here to stay um, and they're not necessarily wreaking havoc. Um, but, um, but it's just important to know that they're not actually um, native. So, um, so yeah, lots of anywhere you go, essentially, you'll see lots of those examples mixed in with natives, um, like our, um, some of our wild raspberries. And um, we've got, I think that that would be a choke cherry there. Um, and then we've got a lot more blackberry kind of trailing within this area. So this is another really great example is when you find one berry, you're probably going to find all kinds because there's been an animal here eating, um, you know, leaving their droppings with lots of berry seeds. So this is probably a really great area to find edibles. Um, yeah, so we'll keep moving. Yeah, so all these yellow guys here, this is toad flax, which is, it's, it's not native. I mean, it's like, it's not a big problem, but it's, it's actually really pretty. And if I was someone who wanted to have like a pressed flower business or something, mm -hmm. this is something I would, because there's so much and it's not native. So it? it's called toad flax. So it's got like these yellow, like kind of dark and light yellow um, flowers. And then it does look a lot like the trefoil, which is this guy here. And then there's a vetch here, which is also not native, um, but it's a really good nitrogen fixer. So you find it all over the place, but um, also not native. So, okay, I see some cherries. So I can go in and get them. If you guys, I, I don't know if you want to come in or not. It's a little wet, but. Um, okay, so. Mm-hmm, okay. So these are choke cherries. I have to eat them to check. So um, in the Sudbury area, we have quite a few different varieties of wild cherries. We have pin cherries, choke cherries, black cherries, sand cherries. I might be forgetting some, but we have quite a few. And you can easily um, identify them with, with any guide or app. Um, and you know it's a cherry because when you look in the seed, you have a big pit, a big cherry pit. So that's how you know it's a cherry. They're really different from commercial cherries in that they're small. And even the pin cherries, which are probably the most palatable, are still pretty sour. Um, the choke cherry, if you guys want to try it, um, is super sour. So that's where it gets its name. You kind of like the redder they are, the 
the less sour they'll be, but they're still pretty sour. Um, it kind of makes you like pucker and, and sort of like, mm-hmm. um, and they can be sweetened more by freezing or adding them to a jam um, with other sweeter things. Um, and there's not a ton of meat on them. So again, they're quite different from commercial cherries, but they're super abundant. Um, mm-hmm. So uh, so this is a stand, as far as I can see, this is all choke cherry. Um, pin cherry, once you um, see the difference, it's pretty easy to, to identify the difference. They hang on longer sort of stalks. So the cherries hang like more kind of on their own on longer stalks. And it's a little bit sweeter than the choke cherry, but we have a lot of choke cherry in Sudbury. So if you wanted to do something cool with wild cherries, choke cherry is pretty abundant. Um, and yeah, you could make like some neat teas with it. You could dry it. You could add it to jams. Um, you do all kinds of stuff and there's quite a bit of it and it's just starting to become ripe. So these cherries will get a little darker and a little tiny bit sweeter. Um, and then you'll see when they're perfectly ripe, the birds are just going to, um, go after them as well. So if you want some, you want to probably pick them pretty soon. Um, once they start to, to ripen to a dark red. So we looked at a lot of berries, uh, but there's a lot of wildflowers that are also edible or have medicinal properties. Um, A really great one is fireweed. Uh, Fireweed grows in disturbed habitats um, like weed. So it's really, really easy to find in any disturbed habitat. It's called fireweed because um, the seeds germinate best when there's extreme heat. So um, after a fire or even just a really, really hot day will help to prepare the seeds for germination. But all parts of this plant are edible. Um, So the leaves, the root, the flowers, they're all edible Um, and they're really pretty. So this, if I was looking at, you know, a dried flower business or um, if I wanted to do like baked goods with flowers, this would be a great one because it's abundant. Um, you know, removing the flowers sustainably from a, a percent of a stand is not going to adversely affect it. Um, and uh, yeah, so you could use this for culinary, you could put it in salads, you could freeze it. I've seen people put it in like ice cubes um, and I'll grab some for you guys. Um, and it's cool the way that this plant flowers is that um, it's the whole plant doesn't flower all at once. It sort of flowers from the bottom up. So these flowers have now moved into, they're turning into seed pods. And then these ones are gonna flower and turn into seed pods. So even if you're collecting flowers at one time, um, usually there's parts in the plant that haven't flowered yet. So it's pretty easy to collect this one sustainably, but I'll get you guys all a flower to eat. They taste almost like cucumber-like. But they're, they're really pretty for cooking too. Like they're just these really delicate pretty flowers. Jenny, what are some of like the health benefits? You know what, for this one, I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to look it up what the, the health benefits of this one are. Um, usually, you know, you'll get like health benefits similar to other greens. Oh, okay. Um, try eating like the darker green Cheers. parts Cheers. will have more like <laughs> iron and folate and that sort of thing. But I'd have to look up specifically for fireweed. Here you are. This is fireweed. The whole thing? Fire yeah. Mm. Not bad. Yeah. And and it's like a pollinator magnet. They love it. You want I want to like come with my husband up and not tell him. <laughs> and just like eat things? Just eat them. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's fireweed. It's got a little bit of an herby taste as well. Um, and you'll see like there's a ton of different bumblebees on it and bumblebees are there are you know bumblebees solitary bees sweet bees those are our native bees honeybees are um, they're a livestock so they're you know as as much as we care about them for their pollination we really need to be concerned with our native bees which are the bees that are specialized to pollinate our native plants so um, you know this this stand is supporting all kinds of different bumblebees I saw like four different kinds just in the last five minutes so um, yeah so a a nice stand like this is really important for for pollinators Mm -hmm. and then I imagine you know at uh, at dusk you'd see lots of butterflies on here too and lots of moths so yeah so we just stopped here to take a look at um, sweet fern which is uh, a really really awesome native plant Um, it's not actually a fern 
Um, it's unrelated to ferns, but it does have fern-like leaves. But when you take a good look at it, it's really different from a fern. It's got more of like this bush habit with a woody stem and the leaves are nice and soft. And when you break a leaf off and you smell it, it has this really distinct kind of herbal smell and it makes beautiful teas. Um, it has lots of medicinal properties. You could dry it and use it um, in like uh, skincare products. Um, you could even, you know, bake with it or you could use it as a spice. Um, but it's a really, really wonderful native plant that grows in disturbed sites. So it grows uh, really well around the sides of roads and paths um, in, you know, new fields. It grows in poor soil, sandy soil. Uh, so it's a really um, easy to find native that has lots of purposes um, that um, has a really great flavor too. So. So we've got some mushrooms here and a snail that's doing a really good job eating through one of them. Uh, so there are so many edible things um, in our backyards, but I do not recommend um, really dabbing in mushrooms unless you have an expert who is personally taking you out and personally helping you to identify things. Um, there's a lot of things that we have around that are that can be toxic and poisonous. Um, but none of them are as bad as some of the mushrooms we have that are poisonous. So there are uh, a number of mushrooms we have that um, that uh, are, are deadly and uh, some of them, um, you know, cause like liver failure and, and all kinds of really terrible things. So I don't recommend um, dabbling in mushrooms at all. Um, if you're going to learn about identifying mushrooms, uh, make sure someone is bringing you and uh, someone is uh, that's well experienced is showing you what to uh, what to grab and how to grab it um, it's not something that you want to be an amateur at and doing kind of self-teaching I wouldn't recommend it's just it's just a little too risky um, and I'm not all that knowledgeable about mushrooms so I sort of um, I stay I stay you know away from those um, I've gone on some mushroom foraging trips with um, experts who took us out and helped us to identify you know four or five mushrooms that day and I thought I was really observant and I was like okay I, I get it like I'm looking for all these things and I filled up my bag with mushrooms and at the end of the day the instructor went through all our bags and he was like that's the right one that's poisonous that's the right one that's and I was like oh man like I thought I was doing a good job so it really is tricky with mushrooms um, so you really want to make sure you have someone who's experienced this is not something you want to learn off the internet I would say so so mushrooms they're great um, I tell my kids all the time like you know don't touch them um, because kids touch their faces and they eat with their hands and all that um, look at them don't touch them um, but there's something that's just, uh, you know, a, there's a lot of knowledge required if you're going to um, look at edible mushrooms. So, so yeah, not part of something that, that I'm comfortable with, but we do have some that are edible. You just need an expert with you to help with that. So, sure. Um, a lot of the, you know, there's been a lot of replanting in the conservation area, especially along the trails, which is fine. It's just part of the regreening, you know, but, but at one point, you know, it was more about finding the tree species that were affordable and available. So there's a lot of um, things like Scotch pine in and around Sudbury that's not actually native, but um, but it's here and it, you know, oh, it plays around. What is it? What is it? Oh, what are we like looking at? Oh, oh. And your eyes. Yeah, this able? looks like some kind of butterfly caterpillar. Look how big it is. Woo. How here, so I'll show you guys how to use iNaturalist. So. Okay. Take a picture with my phone. Ooh. Oh, he's decided to just roll over. Okay, nice close up. So you want to make sure with iNaturalist you're getting like it's not, it's not, it's not focusing. the thing you're taking a picture of is like the main focus. If you have all these other plants or things, it kind of the AI on it gets confused. Yeah. Yeah, go back a bit. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So go to my. Oops, that's a sharp fly. Apps. So this is the, I'll show you, this is the iNaturalist app. So it's this little bird, it says iNaturalist. And then all you do is you observe. Oops, oh, sorry. Oh, rough time for you, eh? And then photo library. And then I'm gonna pull up this photo and go add. And then I'm gonna ask it what it thinks it is. And then, hmm. Do you wanna? 
look out in the area sometimes so, I find that helps if you yeah want. it didn't though it didn't find one i don't know if anyone wants any more pictures i'm just gonna put this guy down uh. the mushroom. yeah <laughs> so yeah, it's saying it. pink striped oakworm moth yeah. visually similar so what i would do from this list is i would look these up now and just see what looks right mm -hmm. um so um and there is some oak here so maybe let's try caterpillar so it does look similar i don't know if it's the right one mm. the cut like this mm. thing is a little more red but i bet it's related mm -hmm. so anisoda so if i really wanted to know i would look up anisoda species ontario and it would show me all the related species to this moth mm. so yeah so it's a really great app for identifying anything birds insects plants um yeah. I'm going to put it on top of the mushroom. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> just in case that mushroom is poisonous, so just let yeah, it go. Take He's over here. No, the oh, the mushroom? mushroom. My mushroom uh, dialogue there. Are we going like in an open area? Yeah, so we're going up to a, uh, the top of a little mountain. All right, so we've um, headed into a more open, full sun area. Um, that's where we're gonna find the blueberry plants with the most fruit on them. So blueberries like full sun, um, they like it hot. Um, and these kind of rock faces are great for them because there's not as much competition um, and they can get lots of full sun. So this is where you're gonna find the most blueberries. You've gotta kind of move into a rockier area out of the shade. Um, we saw lots of blueberry bushes growing you know on the forest floor but those are not the ones that are going to produce a lot of berries for us so so we moved up and here we are um, we're at the end of blueberry season so um, we're kind of getting the last of this crop um, in Sudbury most of the blueberries we see are um, called uh, lobish blue blueberries uh, and so that's what we have here um, all parts of the plant are edible you can use the leaves as well to make teas or um, they have like a slight uh, taste like the berries a little more herbal but you can use the berries the leaves um, this spot is neat because we also have a patch of high bush blueberry here behind me which is a different it's kind of a cousin to the low bush and you'll find these as well around they're not as common as the low bush um, but they do have fruit a little later the fruit um, can be a little bigger and um, they do have a slightly different taste. So, so just two different kinds of wild blueberries you'll find um, around the area. And blueberries are, are interesting because they thrive in acidic conditions. And in Sudbury, we know that we've got this, you know, industrial history where our conditions are still a bit more acidic. So you will see them doing really well in very desolate areas. Um, and when you see folks pulled over on the roadside blueberry picking um, you know if you're looking for somewhere to berry pick those are often your best corridors where you see lots of cars pulled over you just want to make sure you're finding a safe place to pull over and like I mentioned at the beginning um, you know the biggest uh, hazard for you is, is traffic when you're while collecting so make sure that you're being really careful where you're pulling over and when you're getting out of your car um, and often those folks you know you'll see their cars and you're like where are they a lot of them walk in quite a while um, to find you know good berry patches so be ready to really head in there and walk quite a while for some of those spots um, and yeah so this is um, this is like a you know standard sort of scenery in Sudbury you've got your low bush your high bush um, high bush as well the leaves are edible they have a great flavor um, a, a lot of animals eat the blueberries um, and blueberries are pretty difficult to grow from seed as part of their natural kind of process they get eaten by something digested and then when they're deposited in the you know the excrement of that animal um, a certain proportion of them will germinate so they can actually be pretty hard to grow from seed yourself but nature does it very well um, so yeah those are some some wild blueberries so we can pick them and make things out of them or dry them and keep them for uh, the winter um, we make jam out of them you can make pie um, you know you can crush them up and 
and uh, you know make teas out of them, make berry teas. Um, there's all kinds of you can use them to, you know, flavor if you like to make wine or anything like that. Or you can even uh, make like health products and um, you know salves and body products with the blueberry leaves because there's lots of medicinal properties as well. So the, this is a high bush blueberry, and that's a low bush. It's just like they're like cousins. So you see how this is like a higher bush. The leaves are a different color, mm. and they're kind of like a velvety leaf. Right. Um, the berries are a little lighter blue, and they do have a bit of a different flavor than the low bush growing over there. Right. And these are like, if you're ever picking and you see these berries that are the size of grapes, right. like these will be like that in a week or two. Okay. It's usually high bush blueberries that grow that big. Okay, so high bush blueberries are usually bigger mm -hmm. than the low bush. Okay. But they're not as common as the low bush. They're not as so, common. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, you find a lot more low bush plants. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, so they're a little, yeah. We're all going to eat off this. Yeah. <laughs> and if you walked around, you'd find more patches of it. It's just not as common. That's why I wanted to stop here because it's kind of cool. To... So um, Gina was just asking about, um, you know, sustainability when picking blueberries. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of folks um, in the Sudbury area who pick blueberries um, for sale. And it's a really great little way for, for people to make money um, because we definitely have, you know, this crop in abundance and people love our Sudbury blueberries. They're so yummy. Um, so some things to consider is, as I mentioned at the beginning of our hike is, um, you want to, you know, be mindful and sustainable. So be respectful. Don't leave any garbage behind. You shouldn't be removing any plants. Um, you know, you shouldn't be pulling off pieces of the plant, plant to pick berries. You can just, you know, easily pick the berries from the plant. Um, for, you know, an example here of sustainability is we're kind of picking from this area and we're, you know, picking here. And, you know, when you look around, this is a crop where not all the berries are ripe at the same time. So you can't really pick all the berries because they're not all ripe yet anyways. But we're picking from this area and we're not going to bother that area or that area. So that's kind of a, a one easy way to, to be sustainable is, you know, you might maybe you cross one patch and you're like, I'm not going to pick from that one, but I'm going to pick from this one. And then you pick from like the second or third patch you find. So you're leaving some um, and you're not, you know, picking a whole area kind of dry because these are um, the future seeds. Uh, of more plants and they're also the food of so many animals so um, so that's one way of looking at it or you can also um, aim to pick a certain percent of the crop from from an area so you might say you know I'm gonna pick you know 10 or 20 percent of the berries from this area and then move on and do the same thing something else somewhere else I find it easier just to say I'm gonna pick this patch I'm not gonna pick that one or that one and then I'm gonna pick that patch I'm not gonna touch these two so so sort of just using your you know your your sense of reason there because um, once you find a good spot that's full sun um, they're plentiful you're gonna find lots so so um, so just leaving some and being mindful there um, in terms of, uh, you know, we talked about blueberries for sale. Um, any product that you're selling, if you can get to the customer yourself, you're always gonna make more money and you're gonna keep more. So if you're selling directly to the customer, you know, maybe you're using Facebook Marketplace or Kijiji or selling through family and friends or you're going to the farmer's market, that's the way you're gonna make the most money. Um, but, you know, there's that time spent interacting with people and planning and, you know, okay, when do you want to pick up and all of that stuff, right? So you have to consider that into your equation as, a, as an entrepreneur. Um, so you may want to consider selling to um, a bulk buyer and they're going to pay you less for uh, per weight of that crop. But it is a more straightforward transaction where you know you can sell, you know, X number of liters to this person and, you know, and it's a done deal. So you're spending less time with that, you know, talking to customers and, and planning. So, so you can go about it different ways, but you're always going to make money if you're selling directly to the customer. Um, so those are just things to consider. Um, and, you know, we buy a lot of blueberries every year um, at Northern Wildflowers because we process them for seed and then we sell the seed. Um, and so we buy them from, you know, a whole bunch of local collectors um, and we just take a look we look on Facebook marketplace mostly and we just check for prices and that's kind of an easy way for you to, to say okay well you know today they seem to be 16 to 17 dollars a liter 
um, okay, it seems like that's what people are paying, but you also have to ask yourself, does that make sense for me? Like if, if I say 16 or $17 a liter, how long did it take me to collect a liter? How, how much am I paying myself? Once I take out, you know, my cost of gas, the time it took me to get here, like how much am I paying myself at the end of the day? And you're going to find some things don't make sense once you do that equation. Uh, and some things do. Um, but also, you know, if you want to you want to approach something as a business, you need to make sure you're looking at that. Or maybe you just want to have a hobby that pays for itself where, you know, maybe you're not making a lot of money at the end of the day, but you're doing something you love and it pays for itself. So those are just all things to look at and consider when you're looking at something like this as a, as a way to earn earn income. <laughs>